Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Ed Jurechen. I'm the director of the Baker Institute, and it's my uh, pleasure to welcome you to our institute for today's discussion on North American uh, energy. Uh, I would like to thank the Council of the Americas and Sempra International for co-sponsoring uh, this event. I would also like to recognize the collaborative efforts from two of the Baker Institute's premier policy centers that have organized this conference, the Center for Energy Studies, directed by uh, Ken Medlock, and the Mexico Center, headed by Tony Tony Payan. Uh, the Baker Institute has addressed the challenges and potential of American energy policy from its earliest years. It was our first flagship program when I first got here. With the recent addition of the Mexico Center, uh, we are creating a truly binational policy uh, research uh, center dedicated to forging a sustainable U.S.-Mexico uh, relationship based on shared interests and values uh, in the area of energy and infrastructure, as well as health, trade, education, and very importantly, the rule of law. I'm pleased to report that the close coordination between the Center for Energy Studies and the Mexico Center has been strengthened recently with the addition of Dr. Francisco Monaldi, a distinguished economist from Harvard's Kennedy School, who is a new Baker Institute Fellow in Latin American Energy Policy, and, and he is with us uh, today. We're fortunate to have Ken, Tony, and Francisco uh, here to build the Baker Institute's capacity on an important set of issues that connect Mexico, the United States, and Canada to each other, and that have the potential to empower the entire Western Hemisphere on the global energy stage. Uh, during these very turbulent times in the energy sector, our discussion today on the opportunities for greater coordination between the three countries and the challenges to closer integration is an important step on the path towards North America realizing its potential to become a collective energy and economic powerhouse in the 21st uh, century. We were discussing this just before we came in with our our presenters, and we have President Xi Jinping in Washington now, and of course China is the emerging global power. But when you look at the potential for Canada, the United States, and Mexico going into the 21st century, not only on the basis of energy, but collectively as major manufacturing, industrial, economic, the rule of law, and political stability, the future of the 21st century will largely, I think, be written uh, by uh, North America. So I look forward to listening to your deliberations and would like to welcome my good friend Rob Mossbacker, chairman of the Mossbacker Energy Company, to introduce our opening uh, keynote speaker. Rob has had a distinguished career, as noted in your program, and in addition to his uh, leadership positions in the private sector, was also chairman of the board of the Greater Houston Partnership and president and CEO of OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. So join me in welcoming uh, Rob. <laughs> Ed, thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a treat to be here, be back in my hometown of Houston, and, um, and to be part of a, of a Council of the Americas and Baker Institute uh, collaboration. I want to also add my thanks to the staff of the Institute as well as uh, the Council, and uh, to thank SEMPRA International for their sponsorship of this program. Um, as Ed mentioned, I serve as chairman of the Energy Action Group uh, at the Council of the Americas, and this is a group that uh, uh, talks about hemispheric energy issues, uh, and we try and do that not just in the United States, but uh, throughout the hemisphere. So we've had meetings in Canada, Mexico, Colombia, Chile, uh, and Brazil. And uh, we have continued to build on the same general themes, which are all about collaboration, cooperation, ways in which we can maximize uh, best practices as it relates to the development, uh, sharing, and, uh, and participation in uh, energy together. Um, these topics are important, <clears throat> among other reasons, because 20 years ago or, or so, um, North American Free Trade Agreement uh, was concluded. Uh, this was something that uh, uh, that uh, 
the name that uh, this institute bears was deeply involved in, as well as another name by the name of Mossbacher, <laughs> who was Secretary of Commerce. And so uh, as we discuss the collaboration that is possible, uh, it's wonderful to see the progress that's been made in the 20 years since NAFTA uh, was concluded. And in that time, North America truly has become uh, a global energy powerhouse. As a result of the shale revolution, oil sands in Canada, uh, Mexico's significant uh, uh, policy reforms in the energy sector, uh, you can add the production that the Colombians have generated, uh, the production of the Brazilians and the enormous potential uh, that Brazil has. So you can see why Dan Jurgen would suggest that the axis of influence in terms of global energy policy uh, has shifted from the Persian Gulf uh, to North America. That's not uh, a move which uh, those in the Persian Gulf are taking or are handling lightly. <laughs> in fact, uh, I would suggest that we're in the midst of a full-blown battle uh, between the major players of OPEC specifically the Saudi Arabians, uh, and the North American energy producers about who's truly going to drive the price, who's truly going to determine what supply is adequate, and where is the new sort of normal in terms of uh, energy prices. And uh, gosh, as somebody who's been around this business all his life, and I have, uh, I joined my family's company in 1981. So we've been through multiple commodity swings uh, in that intervening time. I've never, ever seen a time that was more fascinating, in some ways fascinatingly painful, uh, but more fascinating, more complex, more uh, potentially game-changing than what's happening now because of the shale revolution. I mean, here we were, I'm going to introduce Zen in a minute, but uh, here we are talking about building LNG facilities years ago to, to import natural gas because we were going to run out or we were running short. And now we have so much gas, we don't know what to do with it. And here we were importing over 60% of our oil. Uh, and now we're talking about exporting some of the lighter crudes that they can be uh, refined in Mexico and take or swap some of their heavy crudes in our refineries. I mean, how dramatically it's changed. And the Saudis have gone from being a swing producer uh, to maintain a balance to being an overproducer of their own quota uh, and driving prices down to grab market share. So it's really a very, very different game than it's ever uh, been in my lifetime. However, in this hemisphere, uh, it represents a wonderful opportunity for uh, greater cooperation and integration and connectivity, and that means among pipelines and power lines. And, and uh, so our challenge is to try and identify economies of scale uh, and our comparative advantages. And this is a little bit of what, uh, what Zen is going to talk about. So I look forward to interesting set of keynote speakers and panels uh, and, uh, and participating. Um, now, let me introduce Zen Smati, who is president and CEO of GDC, uh, GDs, GDF, Suez uh, Energy North America, uh, which is a division of Engi, one of the world's leading energy providers. Uh, GDF Suez North America has a significant portion uh, or a significant footprint uh, in the region with a focus on power generation, LNG, renewable energy, retail energy, gas, and so forth. He oversees operations in over uh, 60 locations across uh, North America. He joined the company in 2001 as Executive Vice President for Strategy, and previously he was President and CEO of BP Amico Global Power. He's a member of the uh, investment committee uh, and chairs a number of boards of GDF Suez Company. So, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Zen Smati. Thank you, Rob, for your kind words. Thank you to the Baker Institute for inviting me. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. 
Um, I think, if, you, if I may, let me just go to the first slide first. Let's how does it work? <laughs> ah. So where do we get the slides? We're going to get them up here. I can see the slides here, but not there. <laughs> so at some point, yeah. Excellent. Let me see if it works. It does work. Wonderful. Um, so really what I wanted to do, if I may, is uh, to focus on a couple of things. Rather than focus on oil, I know there would be a lot of discussions on upstream and oil, and I wanted to avoid that discussion because I was afraid in case somebody asked me what is our forecast for oil prices over the next uh, year or so. so to avoid that, I wanted to cheat a little bit and focus on slightly different perspective, which is power generation and the gas business in North America. In doing that, therefore, I'm going to leave Canada out for, for, for one minute. That doesn't mean that Canada is not very important. It's absolutely crucial to North America. But let me just take you a little bit through some key things that are changing both in the United States and Mexico uh, as far as power generation and gas is concerned, and then talk a little bit also about a few things that are happening on the technology side that are affecting the business of energy, especially power generation and gas. And finally, uh, maybe talk also a little bit about uh, my company and how we are responding to that within the context of North America. But before all of that, I wanted to talk about GDFs US and NG and why do we have two names and stuff like that. So please bear with me. I just used two slides to introduce the company. I think some of you may know who we are, but others don't. Uh, we are actually GDFs US, and we are changing our name again. <laughs> and uh, our name will change at the end of the, the year to, to NG. Uh, where does NG come from? Uh, well, we are actually a French company. And NG is short of for energy, so that's why. Don't don't ask me why it's NG, etc. We paid a lot of money to get that name, <laughs> so so it must be good. Uh, so so the name is is changing. Some of you here in the United States probably knew us when we were Tractable and then Suez and then GDF Suez, and now we're going to be uh, NG. But uh, it's a company that has changed a lot over the years, uh, transformed in, in an amazing way. Our focus is mostly power generation and gas, but we also have an EMP business, and the EMP business is mostly in Europe, uh, Middle East, and Africa. We really don't have any EMP activities here in North America. We are a company in terms of revenues. We have around $80 billion of revenues, 150,000 employees. Uh, in terms of generation, it's around 120,000 uh, megawatt of generation. So we are the largest power generation company in the world, and probably the second largest gas company in the world, especially in terms of LNG. We have LNG activities around the world. You can see where we are. We are everywhere. But, but to be fair, the focus for us has always been Europe, and we still are uh, one of the largest players in Europe. Uh, active in the Middle East, active in Asia Pacific, active in Latin America, and North America too. Um, as far as North America is concerned, we've been here for 20 years, and we are active in, in a number of, of uh, uh, activities. We are in the LNG business. We have two import terminals. I agree with you. Uh, in fact, I stood up in a Sierra conference trying to forecast the future, and I said, look, the United States is going to be the largest importer of LNG in the world ahead of uh, Korea and, and Japan. That was the latest forecast that I had at the time, so I didn't do any more forecast since. <laughs> but uh, uh, so we got it wrong. Uh, I'm glad to say I wasn't the only one. But we, we do have two terminals. Uh, but we are also in the process of building a terminal in the Gulf to export. 
uh, LNG to, to Asia and, and to Europe. So we are in the business of importing as well as exporting LNG uh, here in the United States. We have a gas storage business, we have a transportation business, we have pipelines mostly in Mexico. We have four pipelines. Uh, we are building a large pipeline linking Texas all the way down to Mexico City, Los Ramones. We're working with Pemex there. We have a power generation business, relatively large, 13,000 megawatt. We have gas distribution companies, six of those, and we have a retail. So I, I'm not really trying to brag about the company, but what I wanted to highlight is we're active in different activities. So we see things that are happening in North America, maybe ahead a little bit of, of other people, because we, we can see what the behavior of customers is, uh, what they want, uh, and what they're looking for. Uh, you can see a lot of the stuff that we do is in the Northeast and, and Texas. Uh, Canada as well, we have a large renewable business, mostly wind uh, generation. And, and uh, Mexico, we've been active for a long time, and you have a lot of activities there. In, in terms of the region, uh, we really uh, rate this region number one in terms of investment uh, for, for the group. Uh, if you look at population, I think this is the obvious 480 million. If you look at population growth, it's uh, population is still growing in North America. That is not the case in other parts of the world, especially uh, Europe. GDP, it's a $20 trillion uh, region. It's a huge region compared to many, many other regions. And growth is still growth, uh, you know, 2.8, 3% growth. Uh, clearly, many parts of the world would envy that type of, uh, of growth uh, here. And electricity consumption is huge. It's 4,500 terawatt hours. If you look at the United States alone, if you look at capacity, it's 1,000 gigawatt. It is really uh, huge and, and large indeed. Now, uh, in terms of, of us as a group, how, how do we look at, at uh, growing, etc.? We, we have decided that... Uh, Things are changing in mature economies, uh, especially in, the, uh, in, uh, in uh, Europe, but also a little bit in the United States, uh, UK, and Australia. So in terms of investment in large infrastructure projects, we're trying to move that investment mostly to emerging markets, and, and Mexico is one of those emerging markets. So we're trying to invest you know, kind of billions of dollars. We, we are in the infrastructure business. We invest billions of dollars. Any, every time an investment is, minimum is around $500 million. Those investments are actually going mostly to emerging markets today. And, and I, I'll explain why in a minute when I talk a little bit about uh, the impact of technology. So in terms of investment in mature markets, we really are looking more at... Um, uh, getting into the services kinds of business, less about investing in big power plants, big gas plants, because we see demand that's actually going down. So two different strategies, focus on services, focus on being close to the customer when it's to do with mature markets, when it's to do with emerging markets, focus on investing big dollars in infrastructure, gas, and, and, and power generation. That's, by and large, how we are looking at the world today, and we are present in, in about Handed countries. Now, the United States, uh, and, and that's uh, that's my my focus here uh, today. Things are changing. Uh, really, is is quite remarkable, and really, it's one world. You are all aware of it. It's shale gas. It's it's it is shale gas that has transformed uh, at least the gas and power business here in in uh, North America. But it has also transformed the gas and power business uh, around the world. If you look at uh, shale growth, if you look at the growth uh, there, it, it is quite remarkable. Uh, uh, you know, the, the expectation is that shale gas is going to be 45% of U.S. gas supply in the future. Uh, expect demand uh, to go up, but supply will actually double. So there is no stopping uh, shale gas, and that is quite remarkable. But, but with the amount of shale gas that's available in the United States, I mean, one knock-on effect, if you look at worldwide, is uh, there is a lot less coal that is being burnt in the United States, and all of that coal is actually uh, moving to Europe in particular. So when you look at CO2 and uh, global warming, etc., uh, the amount of CO2 in Europe is actually going up, and the United States is going down without really trying very hard, which is kind of a, thanks to shale gas. Um, 
But, but, but the, what is the impact? The impact of shale gas is really investment, not just in shale gas, but in everything else. More than $300 billion are needed over the next two decades in, in all sorts of activities around, around gas. It's midstream investments, clearly, but other activities as well. I think we here in Houston, in Texas, we see quite a lot the benefit of, of shale gas, but also everywhere else. Uh, so uh, gas flows are changing, uh, massive investment in energy, massive investment in the petrochemical business, and more is needed, not less. So the impact of shale gas is huge, and this is stating the obvious. So really the story, as far as I'm concerned, in the United States is shale gas and the impact of this gas on other industries and investment in, in, uh, in other industries. Um, now Mexico. What is the story there? U.S. is shale gas. Mexico, actually, I picked energy reform as a story. Uh, it is quite remarkable what happened in Mexico. Nobody would have predicted that the Mexican government will be able to change the constitution to be able to, prima, uh, to privatize companies like Pemex, CFE, etc. It is quite remarkable. Uh, it happened, uh, I think. Uh, congratulations, honestly, to the new president in Mexico, to the team around him, how he's been able to do it. I've been going to Mexico for 20 years now, and every time I used to talk about that, people used to say, this is impossible, it can't happen, it just, just uh, can't happen. Well, it happened. And that is having a remarkable impact on, on Mexico and indirectly on the United States as well, because by having uh, this energy reform, which is now signed into law, uh, there's been a lot of changes uh, that really have happened. Uh, and and uh, t talking about Mexico here, if you look at the GDP of Mexico, obviously forecasted that it will it will grow. Uh, you, if you look at GDP per capita, is growing as well. So the country is growing thanks to energy reforms, but also thanks to shale gas. Uh, again, uh, it is uh, quite remarkable. So. Two things, energy reforms, which is changing a little bit how uh, the energy mix uh, is going to work in Mexico, but more importantly, it's attracting a number of people into, into Mexico. Uh, unfortunately, one of the drawbacks, I used to travel to Mexico, it used to be very easy to go there, but now every time you go to Mexico, you have to line up for at least an hour because there's so many people now going into, into Mexico. Uh, it used to be uh, great for a company like, like ours, we've been there for a long time, so we never really left Mexico even when things went down, but now we've seen more competition, especially from Japanese, Koreans, uh, and obviously Spanish companies coming into, into Mexico. Uh, why? Because Mexico needs a tremendous amount of investment, especially, especially in uh, the power generation business. You're talking about $120 billion of new investments uh, uh, that are needed in power generation. A lot of the power generation uh, is, is, is aging. It burns, they burn lots of oil. Uh, but now, being part of NAFTA, they can actually use gas. So just imagine that uh, uh, in Mexico, the cost of gas is just is Henry Hub. So when prices are two and a half dollars or three, dollars. That's the same thing in Mexico. We have a gas distribution business. We've had it for a long time. We've had difficulties growing that business, partly because gas prices back in 2008, they were $15. Uh, so the competition from L LPG for us was huge. So we weren't able to grow that business. Now it's growing gangbusters. Why? Because compared to LPG, natural gas is a lot cheaper. Uh, and so a lot of Mexicans are switching to natural gas. That's just one, uh, one example of, of the things that are changing uh, in Mexico. But the, the investment that's needed in power generation uh, to meet all, all the demand. Uh, uh, also, we, we looked at the car industry as well. Mexico is actually number one in terms of manufacturing cars, number one country in the world in terms of uh, manufacturing building cars. Uh, there as well. So a lot of businesses. Uh, Mexico, as we know, I'm stating the obvious here, it's got a lot of advantages now because of the energy reforms. Two, cost of gas, which is handy hub, therefore it's low. Three, being very close to the United States and, and uh, 
movements of goods and services between Mexico and the United States. Three, you know, by being close to the United States, it's, you have a huge market here where you can move your goods. And, and finally, of course, uh, productivity is high. Cost of uh, doing business in, in Mexico is low. Uh, you know, manpower cost uh, very low. And, and that, that is giving Mexico tremendous competitive advantage. So power generation, gas, uh, another area where uh, Mexico is moving extremely fast to build as many pipelines as possible and bring in as much gas as possible from the United States. Uh, we are involved in Los Ramones uh, in partnership with Pemex. It's an investment of $1.1 billion, but uh, there's a massive amount of, uh, of investment. Uh, you can see here $15 billion, but more is, is really needed. Uh, Mexico wants to buy as much gas as possible, bring as much gas as possible from the United States, and then link uh, the north to the south, uh, and that's how, how they, and they need to do that as quickly as possible. So there's been a lot of tenders, both from Pemex uh, as well as CFE. So massive investment in, in pipeline infrastructure. And if you take it to extreme, you will see that really where we are heading uh, is that uh, there will be total integration, especially between Texas and Mexico. Uh, we see that uh, a lot today from a, a gas perspective, but also from a power generation perspective. The, the two areas will be intertwined uh, and, and uh, they will depend on each other. There is absolutely no doubt about that. It is happening today and uh, the network will be completely integrated, whether you're talking about transmission line or whether you're talking about um, pipeline gas. So really what I uh, try to highlight very briefly here is that uh, the U.S., the story is uh, shale gas, and, and Mexico, it's energy reforms, but shale gas from the U.S. as well, and as a result of that, massive investment is needed, is ongoing, uh, and, and uh, it is happening. However, I don't think that is the complete story, though. Things are changing. Things are changing and changing fast. Although gas is important, big power generation is also important. Uh, but technology is changing few things. W what I wanted to highlight, and it's a little bit different from maybe what, what you expected here, is uh, talk a little bit about some technologies which will have an impact on, on investments in, in power generation and gas, uh, and, and uh, therefore EMP. Uh, one kind of investment is uh, residential PV. This is building solar panels on your roof. A lot of people say, well, uh, it's still very expensive, especially here in Texas. We haven't seen a lot of that. One of the reasons what, why we haven't seen a lot of that is here in Texas, actually, we pay very little for the cost of our electricity compared to other states and other regions around the United States. So therefore, it's still quite difficult. Although it started, it's still quite difficult for solar PV to penetrate the Texas market. But it's here uh, uh, today in terms of cost parity. Uh, certainly uh, you can do it in California, you can do it in New York, etc. No problem at all. The next uh, thing is can you completely disconnect from the the grid uh, today? And the answer is absolutely you can do it. Today it's happening in Hawaii and, and maybe also in California. So the, the concept of having rooftop solar together with, with a battery um, uh, may make sense even today and it will make sense uh, over the next few years. Uh, electric vehicle, I think you all know about Tesla, etc. the impact that Tesla had uh, and more and more electric vehicle will happen. Uh, distributed generation is crucial as well instead of building these huge power plants, can you build small power plants for, uh, for a housing estate, etc.? Does it make sense? Is it, uh, uh, can you make money from that? The answer is yes. Net metering, uh, this is the concept where if you have excess electricity, can you sell into the grid uh, at an, uh, an attractive retail price? It is in many states you can do that. And smart meters are happening, and, and with smart meters you can do all sorts of things with, with uh, connecting your home. To, uh, to the grid. So this slide, actually, we did it a few months ago. Uh, and in fact, the dates are probably now uh, honestly out of date. If anything, a lot of things should be moving more towards, uh, towards the left there. Uh, 
uh, more things are happening uh, today. Um, and, and, uh, and, and talking again, coming back to North America, so you, so you see that, and that, which are the forces that are shaping the North American business? So uh, we talked about shale gas and oil. That, that's clearly, uh, clearly the first one. And one thing maybe I didn't mention about shale gas and oil as well uh, is that um, think about pre-2007. Uh, we have a regasification facility in the state of Massachusetts. And uh, that used to be the best market in the world. Uh, Algonquin uh, and most of the gas was really going from here all the way up to the northeast. So the flow of pipelines was all up. And if you look at the basis, the difference in price between Henry Hub uh, down in the Gulf and let's say Algonquin or, or Boston, uh, it was always positive, a dollar, etc. But now, it's completely changing. If you look at what's going on there on the right, is that the flow is reversing. Is actually all of the gas is moving down here to the Gulf. Why? Because it's trying to move to all these liquefaction facilities that are being built. We have four or five that are being built right now. It is quite remarkable. This is a huge, 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 huge uh, impact on, on the gas business. And more importantly, uh, look at price of gas. Um, in, uh, if you, these are the three, uh, three or four prices. Uh, if you look at NYMEX, uh, it used to be the average of about uh, $8, but in 2008, actually, it hit $15 in the summer. Uh, now it's less than $4. Uh, NBP uh, Europe, uh, look where it used to be, look where it is now, $6. Uh, in our business, we, we import, we used to import gas from Trinidad to, to, to Boston. Uh, at one point before 2008, we used to bring as many cargoes as possible to Boston because prices were very high. After 2008, we moved all of the gas to Asia, especially to Japan and Korea. And now, we really don't move gas anymore because prices are down everywhere. Uh, it's down, obviously, because LNG is linked around the world anyway, is linked to the price of oil. Oil prices are down, so price of LNG is down significantly. And in the United States, obviously, price of uh, gas is down, which is quite remarkable that today, even in this depressed era of prices, still Henry uh, Algonquin, Boston, in the winter, is still one of the best markets in the world. It tells you something about prices. Uh, I said I won't get into uh, forecasting prices, but I'm sticking to gas here. It tells you something about prices, and, and prices are really, really down in, in a massive, massive way. So that's really the, uh, the, the impact. Um, but I wanted to talk more about the impact of, of uh, technology here. And, and uh, apologies, this is a very busy slide. But solar PV, look at prices how they've come down. Uh, and I told you we've done this a few months ago. Uh, this is trying to uh, look at price of uh, solar dollars per watt. It was around $5. The forecast is we're going to be uh, around 1.8 or so dollars per watt by 2020. Let me tell you that, that um, the state of Austin went for an RFP. They wanted to build large solar panels. And they had bids from various manufacturers uh, and various uh, power companies. The price that they got for a solar panel was less than $40 per kilowatt hours, uh, $40 per megawatt hours. It is amazing. It is mind-boggling, this price, $40 per megawatt hour. Let me just put it in context for you. If you build a gas-fired power plant and you burn gas there, and gas, let's say it's $5, uh, through a heat rate of seven, that five times seven is thirty-five dollars. So the cost of gas alone at five dollars is almost the same as the price of power coming from a large solar uh, power plant today. It is amazing. That cost is coming down in a massive way and having a huge impact. So when you look at penetration of solar, uh, it is it is huge. Um, battery is the next big thing. And it's happening. A lot of you have heard about uh, Tesla, what they're trying to do. They made an announcement, the, the battery pack, uh, power pack from Tesla, uh, price of around $3,000. So you can put two together, $6,000, plug them, put them together with a solar panel, and off you go. You can disconnect. 
Uh, you can do that today. Prices also are coming down in a massive way. And when you, you wait until Tesla will build their uh, gigafactory in Nevada, uh, which will uh, uh, meet, uh, I think it will produce around 50 gigawatts per year of battery. I mean, this is just numbers are mind boggling. The United States total capacity is 1,000 gigawatt. This will be able to produce 50 gigawatts of uh, battery storage is 5%. It's just amazing, amazing, amazing. And uh, this is in line, when you look at all of this, this is really in line with uh, the cost of computing, uh, which has been coming down drastically. So the curves, uh, they don't look as steep here, but they really are steep. And that's, that's what's happening, which is changing, which will have a huge impact as you, uh, you uh, use less gas, because you're now moving towards solar. So the impact on gas prices would be huge. Today, if you look at uh, the United States, or, or Mexico for that matter, uh, the largest amount of gas is being burned in gas-fired power plants. So if that demand is going down, then, then it is going to have a huge impact uh, in the future. The second uh, revolution that's happening is dip distributed generation. Before, the concept was you have to build big is better, is cheaper, is more beautiful. So everybody was building centralized power generation. Today, actually, small is better. And you can do it cheaply as well. And there is a revolution uh, moving towards distributed generation, how you deliver power. But I also want to talk to you about some basic stuff. Be, uh, that, that is technology which is real. You invest money, etc. But there is another area that uh, people are overlooking today, which is in the lighting uh, area, lights here. Uh, I remember two years ago, I went to uh, Home Depot. I wanted to buy an LED bulb to change my light bulb. The cost was $50 for an LED uh, bulb. Now, same bulb. I went to, to buy another one not long ago. I paid $2 for it. So in two years, cost has come down from 50 to 2. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because the consumption from LED is almost nothing. So just imagine, as, because the cost has come down drastically, as more and more people switch to LED, the demand for power will go down drastically in most states. Granted, for example, in Texas, obviously we use a lot of AC. Then couple that with using uh, more efficient AC systems, and then really you have a massive, massive, massive impact on, on demand. And here a curve to show if you just, if everybody was to switch to LEDs, which is inexpensive today, the impact would be huge. So demand will go down. You probably don't need to build any more power generation. You don't need as much gas, etc. And therefore, the impact on, on North America is that gas will have to be exported. So there'd be even more gas available around the world when, uh, from the United States. Couple that with the fact that there's a lot of LNG facilities being built today in Australia, etc. So they could be a lot of glut. Unless demand increases drastically and China comes back. You know, you mentioned China before. China, China today, obviously, demand is soft from there. So we need to have massive demand coming from China, from India, etc. to take care of the potential increase in uh, in in. Um, uh, supply from the United States. Finally, energy policy, I want to touch on that. Again, as it relates to, uh, to gas, uh, you know, in the United States, really, uh, although there are EPA rules, etc., but reality is that uh, uh, nobody is paying attention to that. The reason why nobody is paying attention to, to it is because gas is taking care of everything. Um, it is as simple as that. The reason why so many coal-fired power plants shut down, not because of EPA rules, but frankly because of the cost of gas. So it's much cheaper to burn gas in a power plant than it is to burn coal. So uh, potentially you have 70 gigawatts, 70,000 megawatt coal-fired generation that is uh, shutting down. If you add that to energy efficiency, etc., the impact is, is huge. Finally, my, la my last slide here is to say, OK, so what do companies like ours do when uh, kind of uh, you have this, uh, this scenario here? Uh, that's why I said um, 
in emerging markets, demand is still growing, growing very fa fast, etc. So we still want to continue building these power plants, and that includes Mexico. So we really want to continue to invest there. But in other countries, uh, maybe like the United States, where things will move, but not... I mean, by the way, all that I described to you is really a reality today in Europe. And that's why demand is not growing. We see that. We had to shut down a huge number of power plants there. We took a write-off of $11 billion last year as a result of all our gas-fired power plants, brand new, that are not operating because power prices are kind of negative. So we're trying to, to, to do things differently here in the United States uh, and therefore move into a different kind of business. For example, we're moving to LNG in the US. For, there is a huge market in LNG for trucks, <coughs> ships, etc. So instead of building very large liquefaction facilities, we're going to build small liquefaction facilities in the middle of the country to serve this market, whereby people can switch from uh, fuel oil maybe to, uh, to LNG. So these are the kinds of applications of gas that we trying to grow consumption of gas. CNG is another application that, that's happening. In terms of power generation, we're moving more towards contracted power as opposed to merchant power, uh, looking at maybe repowering some coal-fired power generation as well, uh, and, and looking uh, really as, at being close to the customer. We are increasing our retail business where we can supply distributed power generation. We made some acquisitions. Uh, of battery companies, of uh, solar companies, to try to get as fast as possible into, into that business that is growing. Uh, I'm not forecasting the doomsday scenario for the United States uh, over the next five years. I don't think it will happen. I don't think what happened in Europe is going to happen in here very quickly. But I, I really do believe that it will happen here over the next 20 years or so. So companies need to, to be prepared for that, and, and we are trying to do that, and we are trying to learn the lesson from what happened to us in Europe so that it doesn't happen to us here in the United States. I'll stop here. I think I've used up all my time. Thank you very much, and uh, available for any question you may have for me. Shall I go? Just no, stand right here. Okay. I, um, so we have a few minutes for questions. I, I'd like to start with one, and this is <clears throat> getting straight into the crystal ball gazing. So um, you talked about the abundance of gas in the United States and the abundance of gas that's being discovered all over the world, East Africa, of course, the <clears throat> core Persian Gulf, Middle East, now the Eastern Mediterranean, um, and the economics. Are, are changing dramatically as well as in terms of price. So when you started shipping gas to Japan or uh, South Korea and Japan, uh, I suspect you were uh, getting a price through the so-called Japanese cocktail or mixed price that was quite hefty. As those prices start to come down with the abundance of supply, what does that do to the uh, development of an uh, international gas market? And, and will resources such as off the east coast of Africa, which are quite large but also quite expensive to develop, will those be developed as quickly or will they be played out over a longer period of time? I think the short, the short answer is that it's going to take a long, ti uh, long time. But in terms of some numbers, uh, very, very high level, if you were to take LNG from the United States, let's assume that uh, Henry Hub is $4. Take $4. So you, you're going to liquefy it, add $2 to it. That's 6 uh, And then you're going to move it all the way to Japan, add another $3. You're at 9 So no, in order to make money, uh, and I've simplified it here, you need $10 price. It's not there yet. In fact, uh, only two years ago, the price was closer to $19. So it was amazing. So you have a $9 gap. So if you take a small ship, which has three BCF, if you make $10 uh, in terms of margin, uh, times three, that's $30 million you make per ship. Huge amount of money per ship. But now at prices, as prices have come down to about $8, you cannot ship gas from the United States today anymore. You cannot ship it to Europe. Europe could be a little cheaper, maybe take off a, off a dollar. You cannot. So 
you can make a little bit of money if Henry Hub prices were to come down to two dollars or three dollars, which is amazing. Now, what about the other regions of the world? The same thing, cost of gas is quite expensive there, moving it is expensive. So nobody really is making money from LNG right now. Maybe uh, Qatar could be the exception and, and those who have uh, uh, really uh, facilities that are old, written down, etc., etc. They can still make a little bit of money. But at these oil prices, and today LNG, by the way, is tied still to oil, by and large tied to oil prices. Today's oil prices, nobody is making any money. Uh, certainly we are not, I think. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, would it change in the future? I think if oil prices go back up again, I think things will change. Uh, but if they don't, uh, I think it's going to be a really a dire situation for anybody who is thinking about building a liquefaction <coughs> facility. Also, as you all know, building a liquefaction facility, you need serious money. You're talking about billions and billions of dollars. It's not you know, a few hundred million dollars and you can get away with it. So to, to be able to make that kind of investment and have a return on that investment uh, it is not easy. Mm -hmm. Question. Yes, sir, in the back. You went through a calculation where you used the $5 gas price for gas fire generation. Compare that to solar panels. The fact is that gas prices aren't $5, they're about half that. Uh, and I would say the prospects of seeing $5 gas in this country anytime soon are probably remote uh, at best, given the resource base that we have. You have a utility like NRG who's announcing for divesting their solar business because they're not making any money at it. Uh, aren't there really significant headwinds uh, for the solar panel business uh, in this country absent of government subsidies? Can you really make money being in the solar panel business? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, the solar business prices have come down drastically. I don't know who is actually making money. I think people are making money, uh, the originators, the people who originate the deal, so they're making money. People who are making manufacturing panels probably not making a lot of money today. Uh, nobody seems to be making lots of money yet. Penetration is huge, yet more and more companies are getting into the business. It's very difficult. I agree with you. The solar business is, is very com ultra competitive. And also barriers to entry are very small. Uh, we, we made a small acquisition three or four years ago when we looked at uh, the number of companies, solar companies available. There were about 10. Recently I looked. There are more than 300 companies in the United States all competing for the same thing. So that's, that's one. So can you make money? I think it depends which part of the solar value chain you are in. And, and if you're in the right part, you can make some money. Now, uh, comments about NRG. NRG, uh, in fact, David Crane, CEO of NRG, has actually been pushing uh, you know, the solar business, wind, etc., for a number of years. Realization was that even after five years or more of pushing, uh, he made a statement, you're right, on, on Friday, where he said uh, he's actually going to do what E.ON, European company, has announced a year ago, which is to split the company in two. You have the old business, so to speak, big power plant and the new business uh, and see then if he can increase the value of his stock price which has not performed well at all this year. Now gas, uh, I used five dollars only uh, because I was trying to use kind of forecast future. People are being really optimistic and hopeful that gas prices will eventually go back to five dollars uh, but even at two and a half, three dollars it's still hard to, to make money, for, which is the case today. Uh, very hard to make money from the LNG business, even at two and a half or three dollars, because of where oil prices are. There's a question. Um, <coughs> something about over the next five years, energy efficiency uh, and the coal shutdown, coal plant shutting down in the US. So do you think the there's, there's going to be an oversupply of gas in the U.S. and that will be offset by domestic consumption with switching from coal to natural gas coupled with the energy efficiency. So do you think, as you mentioned, that LNG exports probably may not be remunerative and all of, the, all of that gas will probably be, uh, I should say, consumed domestically within the U.S.? Mm. I don't know whether all of the gas will be consumed in the U.S. because there's just tremendous 
uh, amount of gas here? Would there be more gas consumed? Uh, I think so. Even you know when I talked about distributed generation, etc., uh, a lot of that would use gas. So, so you are right. Uh, but, but you know this is where it's difficult to forecast because on one hand, yes, shutdown of coal-fired generation, maybe a little bit of increase in distributed generation, which is good. Penetration of uh, electric vehicle, all of that should increase a little bit demand for electricity, which should be good for gas, even though that solar is also penetrating a lot. Against that, though, you have energy efficiency. Uh, it hasn't happened in a big way in this country like in Europe, but if you were to think that the same thing would happen here. It's happening a little bit in the Northeast, not so much here in Texas, but if the same thing was to happen, you're gonna see a reduction in total amount of consumption, but more importantly, reduction at the peak, which means that there will be less need for uh, new power plants and therefore less need for gas. So it's a difficult thing to forecast, but look at uh, Europe, Look at Germany, look at uh, Spain, Germany, massive influx of wind and solar. They had to shut down, or they wanted to shut down. They're shutting down all of their nuclear power plants. Very little gas, quite a bit of coal, because that cheap coal is coming from, from here in the United States. Great. Well, <coughs> help me thank Zinsmati for a fabulous presentation. Thank you very much.